Hi there, welcome to another episode of our Mature Medic Spotlights. We are very lucky to have Abby here with us um, this evening. So she is a fourth and final year student at the University of Warwick. Perfect. Yep. Hello, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. It's, it's nice to be on here. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you can just uh, start by giving us um, the story of how you um, got to be a GEM student at Warwick. Uh, so I, it's quite fun, I seem to have a background that every single gem medic does in that my A-levels didn't go to plan, um, I was quite ill during my A-levels, so <laughs> didn't come out with fantastic grades, mm -hmm. but I always kind of knew I wanted to study neuroscience, and that was always going to be my backup option, it was always going to be there, so I went off and did a neuroscience degree, not a biomedical degree, which mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we, me and my clinical partner joke about because he did biomed, um, and then I actually ended up going to a place called U UCLAN, which is the University of Central Lancashire up in Preston. Mm -hmm. uh, like they, they'll say themselves, they're not the top of the world. They're not, they're not anything special, but oh my God, it was the best three years of my life there. And mm -hmm. I think for me, it was the best place I could have gone. Uh, I then re I applied for GEM in 2017 and uh, had the painfully long process of waiting for interviews and so I got an interview for Warwick and King's College London and I got offers with both and ended up picking Warwick of King's and uh, here I am. Yeah. Perfect so in the kind of graduate route a fairly kind of traditional science-based degree and then moving yeah. across. Um, so when did you start kind of I suppose thinking about your medical application again during your second degree um I, I think it was always in the back of my mind but once I got to UCLan I was very much how can I how can I get stuck into uni um mm -hmm. I did do a bit of medical work experience in the summer of my first year mm -hmm. and then coming into second year I only really started thinking about like the specifics of applying in about January time Mm -hmm. and even then it was just browsing prospectuses it was just thinking about what exams I wanted to do mm -hmm. and then over the second year uh some I decided to only sit the UK cat it the gam was mm -hmm. too expensive and it wasn't worth spending nearly 300 pounds or something I wasn't going to be fully prepared for uh so I did just the UK cat and I did some more work experience during that summer and then applied literally as soon as I moved back so I did my UK cap day before I moved back to Preston and then mm -hmm. uh, sent in my personal statement in the October. Mm -hmm. So applying alongside yeah. your final year yeah <laughs> yeah that must have been a lot. Uh, it, it was but I, I had one tutor who was so supportive of me and mm -hmm. was just I, I remember emailing them because I was in the middle of doing my dissertation and it was a it was cell based so I was working with brain cells mm -hmm. and who are notoriously finickety to work with yeah. and I got my interview for Kings and I was just oh, I don't know what to do because I won't be here for my cells and I don't think my dissertation is going to go that well mm -hmm. she went just go just go it's an interview for medical yeah. school go mm -hmm. and I, I had another tutor who wasn't as helpful but then that kind of became a well I'm just going to prove you wrong then so it, it was only one out of the like 30 odd amazing tutors I had but it, it still mm. felt pretty good to get that offer <laughs> yeah definitely definitely the brain cells forgave you for getting yeah. away <laughs> <laughs> they did get affected a few more times just to like really punish me but it's fine <laughs> yeah I think that's just uh in the nature of cell culture work yeah <laughs> it has to be a few hurdles oh yeah can't go smoothly yeah um, so then when you were looking at um university to apply to did you apply to all graduate or where was a mix what was your thought process behind that uh it was all graduate I can't I yeah. couldn't have afforded to the five-year degree and mm. I didn't want to put one down then potentially get an offer for it and then have to turn that down I think that would have killed me so mm -hmm. I just went purely for graduate entry and then I was limited even further because I did do the GAMSAT which wipes out a lot of the graduate entry courses 
and then my because my a levels were a bit iffy that also wiped a few further out so Mm -hmm. I was only applying to Warwick Newcastle and Kings Mm. uh, which was terrifying because I was like oh I'm only applying for three yeah yeah well two out of three offers though is amazing like really amazing I was I still don't know to this day how I got it but it was yeah, that was that was pretty nice to get the offer from uh, Kings as well because I never thought in a million years I'd get that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you know graduate entry medicine is so competitive. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um. So perfect. So you went through the interview process, you had the entrance exams, and then so you started medicine straight after your um, degree going in. <laughs> How did you find that transition? Uh I. I didn't struggle too much because I was used to being in a studying mindset where some people mm-hmm. in my course have gone away for like 10 years, done some work. Uh, I've it very quickly knew that I was one of the younger people in the course with less mm-hmm. experience and that did kind of shake my foundation a little bit. Mm-hmm. But in the end, it, it, it was a step up for my neuroscience course because you're, especially at Warwick, you've actually do all your preclinical learning in the space of, that first year whereas Mm -hmm. other unis do spread it a little bit evenly uh so it was a massive kind of like a Grey's Anatomy textbook to the face Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I remember in the second block here which is uh like what is it heart lungs and Mm -hmm. that sort of systems and there was just a lot to take in I remember sitting there I have quite a lot of friends who've done biomedical sciences have done all it before and they would find it really easy and I'm just sitting there like um yeah there's a heart and that's all yeah. about I can say <laughs> yeah 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 it goes like uh this and it makes yeah. uh, some <laughs> noises yeah I, I think what? it's important <laughs> yeah I'm pretty sure I have one you know like, yeah maybe <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and because Warwick take non-science grads as well mm. don't they so did you yeah. find that kind of did that take a little bit of pressure off the fact that there was people from all different experiences learning with you. Uh, I I think it did. I we don't tend to have the competitiveness here. I don't mm-hmm. see a huge amount of it, and there's none of the kind of I'll lend you my notes, but I'm going to change them so there's errors in them, as I've heard from other universities. I'm like, who has the time to That's do that? Yeah. <laughs> I just don't get it. Um, so we don't have a lot of it here, but I know they non-science grads did struggle a little bit more than maybe I did and certainly more than Bymas did but mm-hmm. um, we've got a really good peer, peer support network system here so mm-hmm. there's a non-science they're not club of society mm-hmm. and it's non-scientists only so anyone who's come from a biomed background they're not barred but they're strongly discouraged from coming yeah, so it's okay. a safe space for non-scientists mm-hmm. So it wasn't so much taking the pressure off, but it, it didn't feel too bad when I was sat in block two, not having a clue what was going on and being able to relate to other people as well. Mm-hmm. And did the neuroscience knowledge, did you get opportunities to, to show <laughs> off with that? I wish. Um, <laughs> I I was the I think I was probably the only one who was excited going into block three, which is our neuro block. Yeah. Um, and I understood I think the big step up for me was that I understood the language. I didn't have to learn what is essentially another bout of language. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just meant that I enjoyed what I was learning, so I was able to pick it up a little bit quicker and then support others. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, I, I don't think my neuroscience degree helped at all. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it can be really specific and if it doesn't apply to medicine in terms of, you know, a clinical presentation or a, a yeah. disease mechanism, then it, yeah. It goes, <laughs> like my, my entire dissertation was on uh, astrocytes, which are a form of glia cell. And mm-hmm. I, I can tell you everything about them and how they relate to Alzheimer's and they got like 10 mm-hmm. seconds in a lecture and I'm like, wait, but, yeah. but that's, these are important yeah Hang uh, on but a not, yeah. <laughs> yeah but not on awards they you don't tend to just treat astrocytes on awards <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah I mean I feel like there'll be that one moment where someone will say something about them and you'll be able to say <laughs> well actually you know uh and then you can drop the knowledge and they'll be like oh wow you know you know a lot about yeah. these I may not know about the pumpy thing but I can do the yeah. electricity thing <laughs> yeah yeah everyone's got to have their niche, yeah. Got to have their niche. Hmm. yeah yeah 
Um, so how did it feel moving into the clinical side? Had your previous work experience help with that? Like, how do you find that? Terrifying. Uh, mm. And that is partly because, so my work experience had sort of been clinical. You have to have hands-on experience mm -hmm. Warwick, but I'd had a bit of an unconventional side in that I'd worked in a community pharmacy as a dispenser okay. and then I was also a peer mentor. So I did a lot of stuff outside the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also on the autistic spectrum. So knowing that I'd gone from like years of education with a beautiful timetable and knowing exactly where mm -hmm. I needed to be, exactly what I needed to do, mm -hmm. it just didn't sit right with me. Um, however, I think what was my saving grace is that I had a clinical partner who had worked in hospital before was like well, was slightly older than me and that works really well in our partnership it also helped that after the end of our first 10 week block covid hit so we had four months off <laughs> so i got to recuperate in that time mm -hmm. so is that something that you have found has become easier or have you found ways to kind of adjust to it like how is it now from the beginning uh it's a lot I don't know if it's a lot more easier but it's a lot easier to manage and handle and know mm -hmm. how to work my timetable so uh, in the final phase our timetable is a lot more different and a lot more structured um, mm -hmm. but I now know how hospitals function and where to get information from them mm -hmm. what's good to go to what's not good to go to so mm -hmm. it's just having that background knowledge and now I kind of know where I stand I'm a lot more forward with my things as well so if I if, if I want to go see something, I won't just stand there and hope it happens. I'll elbows mm -hmm. out, forward in, be like, I'm yeah. doing this today. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think it's just gaining confidence and knowing where you stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, so I've just started my clinical years oh. and I'm <laughs> definitely finding that, you know, the first year, you don't know anything is, you don't no. feel like you should really, you kind of loiter in the background, <laughs> kind of half hoping no one sees you and half hoping someone will see you and, yeah. <laughs> you know, bring you in um and I think it's really hard to pass down to younger years how to manage that because you yeah. do just have to get stuck in and it's a really mm. frustrating I suppose when you want to say oh it'll be to make it easier but I think there is just mm -hmm. nothing like going in and getting stuck no, in but... I think the big barrier for me was that I thought I was been a complete inconvenience every time I asked someone a question or said hello yeah. and the reality of that is just so completely different it's a lot easier on both the staff and you if you go in and just say hello I am this is what I want to do rather than just mm -hmm. kind of hide because yeah. then everyone is looking at you going what the hell are you doing <laughs> so yeah. it's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, what do you want? Why, you know, because yeah. they've got to then think about you rather than if you're there and you're like, you know, I'd, I'd love to take a history. Do you, you know, is that okay? Yeah. They can direct you to that. Um, Especially but, yeah. as the doctors won't notice you loitering in the corner, but the nurses will, and the nurses will get annoyed with you standing <laughs> there. Because <laughs> yeah. they want to pass you off onto someone else who's going to be a lot more helpful. <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh and, so, and I think it just takes a few experiences where you actually feel really welcome and I yeah I was quite surprised that actually I was expecting a little bit more uh yeah resistance but everyone has been so yeah. welcoming and eager to to teach and to have you there yeah. so um yeah it's uh but definitely a steep learning curve and oh yeah you, you move hospital and suddenly it's all a bit different again <laughs> we got uh so we actually rotated hospitals on uh I think it was like the second Monday in March of 2020 mm -hmm. and we all stood there and my consultant happened to be a respiratory consultant yeah. and so we've turned up on the wards uh on our wards like say hello we are and we're gonna be stuck with you uh mm -hmm. very much knowing in the back of our minds what was kicking off and she was like in all politeness please yeah. go away <laughs> um mm -hmm. so we were like oh okay but that uh, hospital's great and then we got back onto a gastro ward and literally ended up being treated like f1s it was brilliant mm -hmm. yeah i think as soon as you feel like you're contributing it changes mm. the the dynamic 100 percent. i love i love being given a task to do i'm like hey mm -hmm. i'm helping <laughs> yeah um, I think I had to, I got asked to go find a, a peak flow meter, you know, something really, 
really you know <laughs> basic but I was like all right when you hand it over and they're like thanks you're like yeah I that was me that I was did me. that I did that yes <laughs> yeah it doesn't take much um okay. how what so did you have to catch up over covid like how did they manage that because your degree is obviously that much shorter but mm. that time is so precious it we were in a sort of convenient place for it to kick in so they picked up our ssc2 module which is our research block and moved it earlier so we do three three clinical blocks in second year and it arrived after our first one so they just picked up our research put it there so we could do it remotely mm -hmm. and then we simply just shift ever, everything back mm -hmm. it has had some impact in the fact of so I didn't get to really choose my my SSC2. I had to do a systematic review and it was extremely hard trying to find a topic that I wanted to research and that had done one in a while. Um, our final rotations are one week shorter and our finals are still that little bit delayed. And we've been told we're not allowed to go outside the UK for our electives, which didn't bother me anyway, because I wasn't planning on going outside the UK for my mm -hmm. elective. But uh, it's... It, it kind of managed it a lot well. It didn't mean we were stuck in second year for what felt like forever. So by the time I like knew I passed my second year exams, it was a revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it kind of did and didn't have an impact. Whereas as, uh, the first years, they had their OSCEs cancelled, so only sat written. Mm -hmm. Final years just had a couple of months to do some revision while they just kind of sat not knowing what was going on and then mm -hmm. came back to the shorter modules. Mm -hmm. so going now into your final year how does that work in times of is still on placement if you've got like big exams coming up how does that all fit together in a, the condensed course uh so I've technically done my third and fourth year in nine months <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't wait to scare people telling them that out of context um mm -hmm. yeah so we it just meant that we uh, somehow Warwick still managed to make it so we could have a two week break in the middle of our eight blocks which was mm -hmm. very much needed uh, but our finals normally they'd be in February mm -hmm. but this year they're back into like the last of the end of March last of March end of March mm -hmm. and then our everything else is kind of in the same place because it's done nationally so our SJTs um, I've got mine exactly this time next week, which is, <laughs> and then uh, PSA will be national as well. So it's, mm -hmm. I think Warwick are quite good in that the big exams are after Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a little bit of a load taken off. Mm -hmm. And then alongside this, doing all your applications for <laughs> um, foundation, it's kind of a throwback to your final year. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, it, yeah it's, uh, I, but trying to explain it to other people who haven't gone through Oriel before is interesting. And I think mm -hmm. that should be a, a communication station in itself for Oroski. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it, it's like UCAS for doctors and the fact of you kind of do it basically the same thing, but it's just that little bit more complicated and that little bit more pressure because you have a two week slot to fill in this, uh, this application form. Whereas with UCAS, you have, I don't know, from September to January. So mm -hmm. it's a... Uh, you can tell who are the finalists and about the beginning of September because everyone's like <laughs> yeah yeah a lot going on yeah <laughs> what have you been looking for in your rankings like does location go over specialities or are you trying to get a mix trying to get a mix so I am applying for the AFP or the SFP program as it's now mm -hmm. known uh, I'm hoping to do a med ed one because that's mm -hmm. that's my passion that's what I'm interested in mm -hmm. uh, so I've picked I've, I've got an interview for LAX, which is the South Thames sort of deanery, mm -hmm. but SFP version, and Wessex, which is kind of Southampton, Salisbury sort of area. Mm -hmm. And then, but for me, I wanted to be near home, but I didn't want to be at home. I've lived out for seven years now. I'm, I'm very much living out. So I'm hoping for Brighton. Yeah. And then it was, it was kind of like, picking around what Kent what had to offer but Brighton uh I I knew I definitely didn't particularly want a psych placement uh 
but I'm lenient on it. So one rotation in Brighton has GP, it has straight medicine, and I think paediatrics. And I'm like, yep, cool, that's me sorted. <laughs> mm-hmm. So for the academic awards, it's special mm. now. Special. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, you, do you have to say what area of research you want to do, or is it just an um, academic block? Or do you kind of apply for a specific type of research? Uh, so it, it kind of depends. So you have the research pathway, the meded pathway, and the oh. leadership pathway. And okay. then your research will be in a in an area. So you'll have a mm-hmm. block that's your SOP block, and you'll do research in neurology or neurosciences or GP mm-hmm. or like it's sort of area or med ed you'll do research in med ed or you'll do a lot of teaching um mm-hmm. I'm not really sure about the leadership ones I, I, def- I didn't go for that so I don't really know mm-hmm. um but that's kind of how it works and is that a new thing with the name change or has it always been the three different pathways you could apply for it's I think it's always been the three different pathways yeah, okay. uh the name change was just to encourage more people to pick it because academic foundation program when people read it they think oh research and you have to publish mm-hmm. papers when in fact it's like med ed isn't 100 percent part of that mm-hmm. and nor is the leadership so they just wanted to try and open it up to more people yeah absolutely i think there were my understanding was definitely quite a niche um application to go into if you wanted to go down a traditional yeah. academic pathway so it's really interesting to hear that actually yeah it's not just that it. Mm. Yeah, I know uh, the one at Wessex, my med ed pathway. Um, they've it's it appealed to me because there's, they've actually got time uh, example timetable what you'd have, and a lot of it is blocked out for teaching medical students, which is exactly mm-hmm. what they want. So yeah. uh, it gives you that little bit of opportunity to just have dedicated teaching time, which is perfect. Yeah. So this leads nicely on to so is this something <laughs> you've developed over med school, like teaching and med ed? uh yeah so it's I, it didn't really hit me that I was interested in it until about the end of second year and I was like oh wait hang on mm-hmm. um but I've I've always liked public speaking I've always liked mm-hmm. teaching um during my time in undergraduate I was involved in a lot of science communication which is like teaching uh it's I completely loved it completely fell in love with it and then when I got to med school Warwick has quite a lot of peer-to-peer programs so I used to do a lot of I, I did a lot of teaching for the when I was in second year for the first years going over mm-hmm. first year content mm-hmm. um and things like that and I, used, I get involved in a lot of uh, meta things so I've done a few bits of gosh with the simulation I've mm-hmm. uh done something else and it's completely throwing my brain now but um, mm-hmm. it it I don't know it's and then I kind of sat down one day I was like oh wait no hang on that's meded I like meded and then mm-hmm. that's kind of spiralled into I've got involved in JASME, which is the Junior Association for the Study of Medical Education, mm-hmm. now involved in ASME, and uh, yeah, it's just kind of going on from there, which is quite nice. Yeah, and I think, like you said, it opens up so many opportunities. You can mm. kind of go down the researching, publishing, but also it sounds like you can focus a lot of on actual teaching yeah. itself. Mm. Mm. But, yeah, it's I, I like teaching, but I've also got ideas particularly like I want to recuperate my loss SSC2 uh, so that's also part of my ulterior motive for doing the AFP yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> and then perhaps maybe a CTF going forward uh maybe, maybe. uh we, we call them kefs at Warwick so okay, when people okay. say CTF it yeah, completely right. blows. Yeah, right. yeah so I I know I want to do something like that uh, I also know I want to do a master's in med ed I want mm-hmm. to work out in New Zealand and Australia for a bit so Mm-hmm. It, it's all there but I haven't completely gone in 2022 I go to do yeah, this yeah so. yeah yeah who knows what order you'll come in but there's who knows? <laughs> lots of ideas lots of maybe ideas. I can combine it <laughs> yeah um so that's kind of the I suppose the med ed side of things mm-hmm. in terms of specialities is neuroscience something you want to follow through on or have you got any ideas on that at all did you originally want to go into neurosurgery uh but there was one experience and it wasn't even with uh, neurosurgeons it was with a student organization and I just it was completely put me off um okay. and then uh I just I don't know I don't know if I'm that academical enough to pro- 
10. I think the field is incredible. I think mm -hmm. like Schneer's surgery alone, I love, mm -hmm. but the stuff that goes with it, not so much. So mm -hmm. I, I know I love peds and I will be peed something. Um, I still love neuro. I really interested in like neuro uh, developmental disorders um, mm -hmm. and things like that. And then I quite like emergency medicine and uh, ONG. Um, yeah. Sorry, not ONG. T and O. There we go. Tino, okay. quite, quite, quite different. Quite different. Yeah, quite different. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it will be peed something, but what it is, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's so um, Gosh is then linked in with Peds as well. So that ties the Meded and the Peds together quite nicely. So how did you get involved in that? Uh, so uh, I actually got involved through another one of my loves, which is social media. And mm -hmm. they Gosh run a summer school conference each year. And it's, it's called Gosh Summer School. Mm -hmm. And it's three days of, it, it's essentially a, a careers fair where you get put in touch with actual doctors working at GOSH consultants mm -hmm. at any team around GOSH as well um and I I won a free ticket for it it's normally cost about some 70 pounds that year and I won a free ticket because mm -hmm. I retweeted it on Twitter and then it just kind of spiraled from there I ended up getting involved mm -hmm. in the team I ended up becoming like a medical student ambassador mm -hmm. um and then the simulation came in with that as well. So I love the nurse that runs the simulation department. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I can't wait to see her again to give her a big hug. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, yeah, it's, I, just, I kind of feel like Alice in the rabbit hole with you tumbling down and things yeah. have just sort of worked mm -hmm. themselves out. Yeah, I think often when you show an interest and a enthusiasm, people notice that and Stuck. yeah and then once you want yeah. one thing and people see you doing that they're like oh do you want to yeah. be involved in this and yeah <laughs> suddenly you're you know everywhere doing a lot yeah hmm. how have you found the merging that and managing that alongside gem um I probably should have done a lot more work in my degree than I'm actually doing <laughs> but I think for me, especially this book, I've also done our med school review because that's something I love as well. Mm -hmm. And I've actually got more work done this block than I think about any other point in my final year. So mm -hmm. I like the pressure. Um, there is a lot of time management. And then recently I've started to kind of learn to say no and start mm -hmm. delegating things because mm -hmm. I just don't have the energy or the time to keep up everything now. So it's mm -hmm. a little bit late to learn, but I'm learning it when I need to. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's will stand you in good stead going forward. Um, but it is sometimes hard. I think the opportunities are so exciting. Yeah. It's really hard to turn them down. Is I I had to not because uh, I normally I do the social media side. Gosh, uh, mm -hmm. with the summer school and their conference, and I had to turn the summer school down this year because it it clashed with the first week of my block, uh, my cute block, and when it's a big no no to miss the first week of the block. Mm -hmm. So I was gutted, but it was. It, it couldn't really do much about it yeah and I think they'll just I suppose have to think there'll be more opportunities yeah and yeah it just does not quite the right time no <laughs> yeah um so then um thinking about any extra like what is review <laughs> like sorry I don't know quite sure <laughs> no, I, it's yeah. like, I think every med school calls it slightly different so yeah, it's okay. uh it's like the performance we put on um it, I don't know in a med school pantomime or something it's, okay, okay okay we yeah we have the tradition at home where we uh tend to take a we, we kind of take a little bit of a laugh at the med school a little bit of laugh at okay. ourselves okay. um yeah, yeah yeah and it's just the evening where everyone comes together and just have a laugh so this year I wrote a scene and I basically made a bit of a laughing stock of the cabinet briefings that we get yeah, uh, okay. so it's just a bit of a light-hearted laugh <laughs> mm -hmm. okay okay um so and then you do a lot of your own social media with like blogs yeah. and youtube <laughs> and instagram I think tiktok as well yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. where do you get all your I suppose like do you feel like you're quite a creative person uh, yeah, I, I can talk for England, which you, yeah. you, which you may have noticed by now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think the big thing that started off for me was when I was looking for uh, kind of advice on how to manage med school on the spectrum, mm -hmm. there was nothing out there. And mm -hmm. I kind of 
wanted to put something out there and then things have just kind of spiraled on from there mm -hmm. uh, so that was my main purpose was to create a resource that other students who are on the spectrum who struggle like mm -hmm. I do can go to and basically have an idea of how it works mm -hmm. and have you found a, like a community within that online uh, I I have mainly I mainly interact with Medfitter side things. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm not 100% keen on uh, Instagram side. I'm not really an Instagrammer. I will take things mm -hmm. photo photos I find interesting mm -hmm. myself, not usually. Um, but Twitter's quite good in the fact of there's a lot of like quite insightful conversations sometimes, and then mm -hmm. a lot of networking gets done on Twitter. Okay. So I've heard yeah. that. I've heard that. It's so good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm not on Twitter and I actually only got on Instagram to start my account showing yeah. you know, from my perspective what medicine's like. Yeah. So yeah, I feel like a little bit of a, you know, not sure <laughs> how it all works. So how do you get involved in these conversations? Do you just jump in? Pretty pretty yeah. much. I yeah. I kind of started out through the jasmine side of it i didn't really have much to do with med twitter before jasmine and then i started following people who were doing the med ed forums that we do every mm -hmm. month and then it just kind of went from there uh i then uh there's a discussion that happens every monday night about what's gone on that week and i quite enjoyed listening to that and yeah it's, it's just spreading out that network and finding out what actual real life doctors are doing instead of me yeah. moaning sitting at home <laughs> yeah yeah okay okay um and do you find the different platforms do you put different content out there or do you suppose like have an idea and then pocket it between different places uh so, so twitter i although i try not to it kind of gets used to voice every single internal thought that I have um okay. it's it's a lot more formal it, it's a bit weird because mm -hmm. it's more open Twitter but I find it a lot more informal mm -hmm. whereas Instagram I feel particularly at the moment because I've seen a shift in the culture on Instagram um okay. it has to be this post that you spent ages thinking about and then writing an essay and stuff and mm -hmm. occasionally I'll do that sort of thing and occasionally it's just like here's a photo of a duck in the snow enjoy <laughs> uh so on uh, my Instagram I mainly use to advertise every time I write my weekly blogs which I haven't mm -hmm. done in a while so mm -hmm. that was that was the purpose of that account for me yeah yeah I found that sometimes I'd try and maybe do a an educational post about what I've been learning spend ages on it but, you know some people would be interested and then yeah. I'll take a random photo take me two seconds and then people are like oh like, yeah <laughs> took me two okay. seconds like I don't know I don't know but, yeah like my um sister sent me a, a TikTok of a duck the other day that had something like 25 million views and you're like well I just don't know like I don't know I'm not a duck I'm not I was like drinking a star but I don't know I, yeah. oh I know that account like you know the duck yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I quite I got invested quite a lot in noodles the pug um, okay okay yeah to the point where I tried to convince my clinical partner that I, I tried to educate him what a no bones or bones day was it didn't go down okay. very well but I was like today's yeah. no bones day <laughs> leave me alone <laughs> yeah you do get so into it I think I was watching a hedgehog on a, doing the little noodle foam noodle assault course I don't know if you've seen him. oh I've not seen that one yeah well I mean I can <laughs> recommend I can really recommend um but I, think... I get a lot of med stuff on there it like okay. it, it seems to like work its way onto my for you, for you page even though I, I I don't particularly spend that much time going down the med side of it but there mm -hmm. we go <laughs> yeah and do you think these are things that you'll carry on into your foundation years um yeah a hundred percent I mm -hmm. one of my uh one of the things I want to pursue with my med career is to start using social media for medical education because they do mm -hmm. it out in the states it's mm -hmm. if you do it right i don't think it's a it, they're not bad platforms they're free mm -hmm. they're wide reaching and let's face it med students on the ward they're not sitting there going through moodle or blackboard they're sitting there yeah. going for twitter and instagram so you might as mm -hmm. well <laughs> at yeah. least put something out there so that's that's my little niche i think yeah okay and would you try and communicate work that's already done to highlight it to people or what sort of things you envision communicating 
so I would make my own things because there's just not that much done like work done in the UK on it at the moment okay a lot of it is US based so mm -hmm. this was the amount of pre-reading I'd done for my glorious SSC2 project that got uh, yeah. that got cancelled yeah, okay. uh so I'd I it's gonna sound really bad but I kind of see myself pioneering that move um mm -hmm. I'd like to be one of the forefront runners of it uh mm -hmm. big aims but you've got you've got to aim somewhere yeah absolutely and I think if you see a gap there then you know and you just I think often you think it's this you know big idea and it often it would be amazing but you just have to do do it and then that's the difference thing. between yeah that's just you know the person that goes and does it is the person that gets it out yeah, there yeah. um so I think yeah it's um these things are achievable and you're already well on the way of <laughs> understanding how to communicate with people on social media and having experience in it yeah I I think I know there's GMC are looking at rewriting the guidance at the moment um particularly after the whole uh I am Philip Lee <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. hash are you um that that went down on Twitter so mm -hmm. I know a couple of people who are potentially sitting on the on the panel for that so I'm quite mm -hmm. looking forward to reading that when it comes out seeing what's changed yeah do you feel as it's something that you're conscious of when you're posting uh so i um twitter not so much so because i tend to base off i look at what other doctors are posting and what's okay mm -hmm. and that's how i tend to go over twitter instagram i i'm open but i'm also a little bit kind of I, I don't know. I, I feel like Instagram's a lot more vulnerable than Twitter is for some okay, reason. Okay, yeah. um, but I do tend to go off a lot of what other people are doing and kind of stick within that. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously it's just going by the basics that don't reveal patient details, yeah. stick with confidentiality. Mm -hmm. It's just being sensible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you'd think that those things, you know, surely aren't going to change. Um, yeah. Into, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. maybe I suppose just updating in terms of. Uh, appreciating that it is a, a platform that mm. a lot of people use and there is a huge benefit from it yeah I it's also so the last time the guidelines were written were 2013 and that was when snapchat was just making its uh okay. move uh okay. so yes they are severely outdated uh, mm -hmm. and I think platforms especially like twitter are being used a lot more for uh, doctors communicating with each other around the country we mm -hmm. um there's a lot of like discussion on that that goes on there's a lot more sharing of things that are wrong in the trusts because mm -hmm. uh, people can easily go oh I'm really annoyed at this on Twitter so I just think mm -hmm. the accessibility just guidance maybe needs to come around that but it's mm -hmm. uh, it's an exciting time I think yeah you're at the forefront leading the way <laughs> <laughs> Hiding behind the consultant, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. tweeting behind, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'll pop up on their phone, and they'll be like, "Huh?" <laughs> Put the phone up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Perfect. So, I'm just wondering if you had your top tip or top tips from you know any part of it transitioning across to med school or being at med school uh what would you share with everybody oh one tip <laughs> well it can be you know I'm not <laughs> it doesn't have to necessarily just be one but um um I think it's I think for me especially in second year when I was just getting pre-clinicals I felt a lot of pressure to suddenly you start being involved in audits and start being mm -hmm. this amazing academic person but I think it's follow the stuff that you're interested in and that you're passionate mm -hmm. about and the opportunities will follow because your enthusiasm is there and also don't sign anything that's just going to put you as a collaborative author at the end no you want authorship <laughs> yeah yeah I got lured into one of those yeah no yeah. run away <laughs> yeah 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 and I think there is a the pressure to you know build your portfolio early yeah. but if you're doing stuff that you're really just doing to get it on your portfolio it's just yeah. in the long run you know like you found a passion and it's so clear and the ideas mm -hmm. come and it's yeah yeah it's I think it may take some people more time to find um their mm -hmm. you know their niche or what they're interested in 
but it's uh, uh, I think also at interviews if AFP and things when you're talking about your research it's going to be mm-hmm. so obvious whether you actually care about what you've done mm-hmm. and they're going to want doctors who actually care enough to do something within that four month block not someone who's sat there and stayed an hour off to hospital every day just so to fill out a couple of data slots to do an audit they're not really interested in so mm-hmm. yeah follow the passions and the rest will follow yeah and I, I really love how things that you find maybe not so interesting there is someone out there who yeah. is so interested in that and they really <laughs> are excited to find out you know whether using a five millimeter gauze versus a four millimeter you know is, has better outcomes um <laughs> yeah so I think I, I was gonna say it's like psych I I, I yeah. just I, I just my brain's just not built for psych but I know people who are absolutely loving it are producing papers on it and things and I'm just like yeah go you but I'll, I'll stick with Twitter if that's okay. yeah yeah and that's fine everyone's got their space everyone's got their yes. space yeah. <laughs> yeah perfect so thank you so much for your time today um I'll in the links below I'll share your well, your Instagram you should, maybe I'll just put <laughs> You know, a link for you or Instagram and people can find you on Twitter, on TikTok, um, on YouTube. the gosh social media, YouTube. <laughs> um, if they're interested in med ed, they'll see you pop up in that space. Um, so yeah, and good luck with your application <laughs> Thank and your you. SJT. I hope that all goes well. Um, and yeah, people can follow your journey as you go forward. Good. Thank you very much for having me. It's been really nice. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.